Hello and welcome back. Eddie Radosovich, Bob Prisbillo here for the Sudoscoop.com studios. Welcome back to the Sudoscoop.com YouTube page. And uh, Bob, this is the Hoops Report. Uh, certainly, it was a rough night on Tuesday. A tale of basically four days for Oklahoma as we can go all the way back to Saturday. The good times. The good times. The 69-65 victory for Oklahoma over Cincinnati. And I think that there was a lot of talk coming out of that one. The toughness of a team out-rebounding a Cincinnati team that uh, really kind of pushed. You knew it was going to be a uh, a tough matchup. But Oklahoma did walk out of Cincinnati with a 69-65 victory. Just kind of an overview of your thoughts following that one. Yeah, you know, it's hard because what happened after. But when you look at that game, like that was a lot of mental toughness that you'd been waiting to see. That, I mean, you really hadn't seen through the first couple of years under Porter Moser with the team that was constructed. But this team has been different time and time again. And that was one of those days where it showed when they're all, you know, playing at a high level. Sure. What they can do. Sure. JV McCollum led uh, a team high 16 points. So take away had really nice moments, particularly at the beginning of the second half yep. to kind of get Oklahoma back into the game. He had uh, 14 points and then Rivaldo Suarez and Latre Darthard, some guys that we have talked about on this program before that are going to be big contributors or needed contributors for Oklahoma. They knocked down the four big free throws in the waning seconds to kind of fend off what would have it went from like a game is like. Okay, this it's an okay game if you end up losing to yes. You have seven. Wait you have a, a minute. You have a seven point yeah. lead with less than two minutes left. It would be a terrible <laughs> loss if you were able to give this away. And it was Soros and Latre that were able to make the free throws, as as you said. And what was important from what I saw, they weren't just forcing threes. I thought that you know they fell in love with that with TCU and Kansas, just getting out there behind sure. beyond the arc, not looking to do anything else. Now they're still playing hard defense. But they weren't trying to drive to the basket, create contact, anything like that. That's changed in the last couple of weeks. So that's been a positive. But, you, you know, now we need some of those, those other pieces to be playing alongside them well. No doubt. And that rolled into what was Tuesday night in Norman. And it was a massive game for a lot of reasons. Uh, we've talked about it, Bob, on the unofficial 40. We've talked about it on radio as well, that this was a moment of opportunity. You had built up so much good fortune, so much goodwill uh, with uh, the casual OU fan base. A lot of you probably out there that... They needed to get over that hump. You had gotten over that road hump with, uh, with, with Cincinnati and winning on the road and the inability to do so in the first two years under Porter. And then you come back home and you had the opportunity, that, which was the beginning of a tough week. I mean, you, have, you had Texas on Tuesday night, Texas Tech coming into town before you have to go back on to the road for two games next week. What a, what a blunder. What a missed opportunity. What a, uh, what a squandering of chances on Tuesday night for Oklahoma in a 75-60 loss to Texas. Really no other way to say it. I mean, you hope it's just a one-game slide, but when you have – when Porter's never beaten Texas, and uh, give credit to Texas bouncing back beating Baylor last Saturday, so sure. you knew they weren't dead like a – It was a, a hungry dead, basketball a, team. A dead team walking. They were motivated after losing – to Central Florida. So they came out ready to go right right from the uh, jump. Took OU a while to try to match that intensity, which is a little befuddling. You know, yeah. when you're playing Texas and you're OU, you shouldn't need a wake-up call like a Jalen Moore dunk to try to get the team going. And these rough starts they've had throughout conference play, it's, you know, it's, it's not just an anomaly. It's a trend, and it's a very disturbing one. The great Ryan Chapman and I kind of tracked it uh, on radio this week just in talking about poor starts. If you take the first five minutes of Oklahoma's conference games, now up to six games total, 13 for 37, 14 turnovers. I, what is the answer to getting off to better starts? Because they dug themselves a hole yet again on Tuesday yep. night against Texas, and you look up, and all of a sudden you're down by nine. Yeah, and you don't expect that at home. Maybe you can see that on the road, but this is not a home road thing. This thing is carrying throughout all of conference, and it is so confusing because of the way that Los and JV and McCollum are able to take care of the ball, why they have so many issues trying to you know get get it right going from the uh, 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 going from the start. And it, it's funny, you know, because Porter Mojo will emphasize it. The sure. turnovers, like he. Every single time we talk to him, he mentions something about rebounding and or turnovers. Yet it's still every now and then it was it was the the boards on Tuesday that really came into play. But a lot of other times it's the turnovers, and it's you almost wonder if there's so much emphasis 
that they don't play as loose and as free as what you might need. It was rough. It was rough. And, and here's the thing, and we talked about this as well. You look at the final outcome of the game, a 15-point loss at home, but with 12 minutes left, you're tied up, basically. Yep. You're, you're down by one. Oklahoma, just every time that they punched, it seemed like in the second half, especially after they had uh, you know built those leads in the first half after the poor start, you did have two pairs of, or a pair of six-point leads, yep. and Texas bounced back every time, whether it be a Brock Cunningham three, uh, whether it be a Dylan DeSue three, and then obviously Max Aismas in the second half, a game-high 22 on the night. Here is Porter Moser after the game on Tuesday night talking about the blunders. I'm not thinking about, I mean, yeah, disappointed. I'm disappointed because we got, we, fans were awesome. I've worked my ass off to get people in here and we didn't, and that's on me. That's on me. So uh, we're thinking about the race this year. We're thinking, but yeah, we, we, we were, we're, um, you know, obviously we didn't play to our standards and then you got to give them credit, but uh, yeah, it starts with me. I put that team out there today and I thought we were, uh, we were ready and we, we looked tired in the second half and uh, um I got to give them credit because I thought they, you know, they made some crucial key baskets in like an eight, a seven, eight minute stretch. They got, they got separation. I'm always saying, don't let your offense dictate your defense. I think our defense dictated our offense. I think um, you got to give them credit. I mean, they, um, they hit some shots. They had the, I think the flagrant foul, and then um, they got two shots, the ball back, and then they max hit a three from like 27 feet. Uh, they, they made some. I mean, they, they played with a great urgency. Uh, they played with a great urgency, and I just I think our guys, um, our, our offense wasn't nearly as crisp and, and quick, and that starts with me. But you could tell that the, the them not, us not getting stops, and they were on that making those shots. Dessou made that jab step. Dessou hitting some threes. Um, thought in the first half we they got up nine. We we battled back, took a six point lead. They came back. Dessou and Cunningham hit back to back threes. I thought every single time we tried to get something, they answered it. And uh, I thought they, their guards played extremely physical. I thought Dessou's was, was extremely, you know, he's really good defensively. Um, and I thought that we, since we couldn't get stops, um, and I thought, I thought, I didn't think we were cutting and moving as hard on offense um, when we couldn't get those stops. Dylan Dessou, 19 points, 10 rebounds on Tuesday night, Bob. And now this has become a thing, especially in rivalry games. Porter Moser are now 1-5 against Texas and Oklahoma State, the 0-5 against Texas, and the 1-4 against <laughs> Oklahoma State. Uh, it's it's kind of uh, confusing in a way because I think that like Porter is somebody that definitely embraces the challenge of yeah. playing against rivals. Absolutely. And every time, and we talked about this off of air, they just it seems like they get out physical quite a bit in a bunch of these games. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a toughness thing. It was l- – last year a bunch during Bedlam and it was again Tuesday and it's a little confusing just because the way they've constructed this team and the way that th- this team has performed that's never been an issue it hasn't been out toughed and that was for the first time is like wait a minute that's that's not the team that we've seen through the first two months of the season so is this the start of a trend a decline of where we see this team kind of fall back to what people first thought they might be, or was it just a one game and an 11 minute blip and are able to overcome it and play like the way they played throughout the first two, uh, first two months of the season, which makes Saturday even more interesting with Texas tech coming up a, a a matchup against uh, all of a sudden the first place team, the the, the only team with one loss in the big 12 conference. Of course, Texas tech did not play this week. We'll get to them in a second. Uh, Let's go back for more from Porter Moser, as well as Jalen Moore and John Hughley on the setback against Texas. Yeah, they, they dominated. I mean, I, I thought DeSue, Mitchell, the high-level athletes, I mean, they were, they were blocking shots, and we we didn't get, you know, offensive rebounds. We had five. You know, I thought Rivaldo came in, but our starting guys, you know, Sam Jalen, Otega didn't have any. I mean, you know, John had one in 20 minutes. Um, I thought I thought the kid Kendall Weaver gave him a tremendous lift. I thought he had three offensive rebounds, 11 points. His energy level, um, you could just see he was playing. They were playing for, um, you could just see the, the urgency they had um, and I thought I thought we at times did some things. We just it was that stretch where they got separation, and then it was just we had some, you know, couldn't buy a basket in that separation. But uh, you got to give them credit the physicality they had on our guards. Credit I credit Texas defense. You know they were pretty physical. You know and, and I, uh, a lot was on us. You know just not getting into our right spots on offense fast enough. To we, we wasn't playing the, the pace that Texas was playing. So like I said, I give credit to Texas. But you know we just got to get back to the drawing board and like I said, executing get ready for Saturday. Just piggybacking off that. I mean shoot, 
we just got to execute, and we're going to get back in the lab, and we're going to get right. So, we good. A little bit easier said than done. In talking about a guy in John Hughley, I think he's starting to stack a couple more games back, uh, back to back, he, maybe even going all the way back to uh, Kansas game, even the TCU game. He played yep. well with 14 points. So, when you're talking about the five for Oklahoma, and I think that there's a lot of people that have watched these videos, and we praise Sam Godwin when he was doing Absolutely. extremely well. He was hitting the offensive boards. You're looking at a situation now where he played, I think, nine minutes at Cincinnati, and he played 11 minutes on Tuesday night, and a lot of that has to do because he's been in foul trouble, and you're also getting a little bit more contribution from John Hughley on the offensive end. You think about making a change at the five and start in terms of a starting rotation. It's really close, and you hate you don't know what that type of shakeup might do to the chemistry. But Godwin has more fouls than points in the last three. That's an games. unbelievable statistic, and that's just not going to get the job done. The problem is with Hughley is he can give you as much as he can in like a five minute spurt, and then he gets tired. Sure, and it's something Porter even talked about last week. He's like, I need him to continue to get in better shape. I don't know how much of that can be done in January with the physicality. And it's, he has proven his big body is more suited for this than what Godwin has yeah. been. And so that's something that obviously Porter and the staff have to take into account here. And the way they've tried to go about it, if it's not Luke Northweather for little you know spurts here or there, they've moved Jalen Moore to the five, which sounds great in theory, until you start wearing him down, and then if he can't be the energy guy that he's been throughout the entire season, then you lose that aspect. So very intriguing to see. I don't think a change happens Saturday, but if you can't get Godwin going again at home, you might have to look at doing something different. Pretty surprising how poor Oklahoma shot from behind, beyond the arc as well on Tuesday night. Just four for 19. I think one of those ended up falling in pretty late in the game, too, to maybe turn it from a 15-point game to a 12-point game. It didn't really matter. It was, it was very unconsequential. But in terms of bounce back, now you start looking towards Saturday. I think that uh, anybody that is familiar with the Big 12 Conference and uh, not – making a bad week a really bad week, a, a week that could change a season. It seems like, and again, we come on here and we're like, uh, don't overreact to 40 minutes, you know, win or loss. It seems like the next 40 minutes for Oklahoma are extremely important coming up on Saturday. Yeah, you don't want to go 0-2 at home on that week you have the two home games. Like, I don't know if any team has, has done that sure. this, this season where, the, you know, you can come out flat once, but you've got to respond. you got to bounce back. And so many teams have shown that ability through the first three weeks to be able to do that. Now it's a sooner chance once again. Because if you, you, again, Porter Moser won't ever look ahead. Don't ask him questions about future games. But then they go on the road to Kansas State and Central Florida. Now neither one of those is like, oh my God, oh, you can't win them. But they're gonna, both going to be very tough games. And if you can't take down the Raiders at home, then you're eyeing a potential Four-game losing streets has become all too familiar under Porter Mojo where they just have that stretch where they lose four or five or lose six of eight, and they you know they lose any type of foothold they had within the Big 12 and trying to make the tournament. So going against the Raiders, who didn't play this week, they're number 20, so it would be a really nice sure. victory. But it's, again, they just have to bounce back. You think uh, Max Asmus was pulling up for deep. Just wait until uh, Pop Isaacs gets in the building on Saturday afternoon. It is about bounce back for Oklahoma coming up this week. Here is Porter Moser as well as some of his players talking about making things right. I don't think we're lacking it. I'm not. I mean, I'm not going to panic. We've this. We've had three losses before this to two top five teams, and and TCU was in the top 25. I'm not going to say to my guys, we don't have a guy to go do it. They've been doing it all year. JV McCollum is an outstanding guard. Look, Milo Suzan's an outstanding guard. I'm not going to sit here after a tough loss and say that we don't have a guy to go get it. We do. I got to put him in better positions. I got to put him in better positions. Uh, we got to play tougher against a tougher defense. Um, we've done that all year. We played great defenses. We were tough as hell at Cincinnati. We weren't tonight. Credit Texas. We'll get better with that. But I'm not going to say that we don't have a go to guy. We got guys that have been stepping up all year. Um, you know, hell, you don't get to be where we're at at 15-3 and three and 11th in the country without having guys. I'm not throwing any of those guys under the bus. We didn't play well tonight. Starts with me. I know those guys. They're in the mirror looking at themselves, too. Uh, and we got to come back and bounce back from this game. And I apologize to the Sooner Nation, man. I've been working out like to get this crowd like this. They were great. They were great, and, and we, didn't, uh, we didn't win. We didn't win tonight. And uh, um, 
we'll bounce back. For, we'll bounce back. Yeah, I feel like as players, you know, this game hurts us. But like you said, this is a tough conference. We got to move on to the next game and, you know, study Texas Tech and see what they do well and, you know, just go out there and execute what we need to execute. Um, I feel like a loss is, is always disappointing, especially on, on the home court. Um, but as far as, like, physicality and, and style of play, I mean, we had a great prep. Um, we just got to come out and, and capitalize and get the dub next time. We're going to see him again, though. We, we got to bounce back. We got to bounce. This can't define us. I mean, we got to grow from struggle. We struggled. We got to struggle, go, grow from it. Um, but you got you to get, you, you get back and go get on one game win streaks after this. And that's, that's the next one. So uh, um, we have a much needed day off tomorrow, but we got to regroup. We got to regroup. And uh, Texas Tech is, is on their bye week. We know that. Um, but we got to get rested and get ready for another physical defensive game. And we got to grow from this struggle. JV McCollum just three for 11 on Tuesday night, nine points. Not the typical night that we had seen from Oklahoma's uh, leading scorer in conference play moving in. Yeah, the most disturbing factor for me was that it didn't seem like he was trying to insert himself into getting the team back on track in the final five minutes. I'm not saying like he was scared at the moment. I don't know if he was just beat up. He it seemed like they tired. were a little shell-shocked when yeah. Texas went on that big run that expanded the lead in late in the second half that put it out of reach. It seemed like a couple of shots from A. Smith and DeSue just deflated them mm -hmm. and, and where they had bounced back before because they were, they were down 47 to 39 because Texas came out red hot to yeah. start the second half. So it goes from 47-39 to 55-54 Texas with 11 minutes left. So you're thinking you're just, this team's just going to keep punching back and forth the entire way. And it just seemed like a couple of those shots just put the nail in the coffin. It's like we just don't have it in us. For whatever reason, tonight is not the night where we have it to try to fight back. Deflating for the guys on the roster, and it was probably it just as deflating for the Oklahoma fan base that I, I do want to say well done for everybody that came out and had to watch and sit through that on Tuesday night. It was a really good crowd at Lloyd Noble. And I, I think that that's where the, the bigger conversation comes in. And just in terms of, it seems like every time that they've been able to pack out the LNC, they have put out an S burger in terms of a uh, performance. Yeah. You go back to last year, you go back to Bedlam, you're coming off that win against second ranked Bama. Yeah. And then it's standing room only because... The most people I've ever, ever seen, seen in the Lloyd Noble Center. Because of his free, because of the weather. Sure. And they couldn't even get within 10 points of the Cowboys the entire second half. It, it was better than that, but not much. Because this left a real sour taste in your mouth. Because Texas is not 15 points better than OU. And OU is clearly better than what they showed in the last 11 minutes of Tuesday night's game. But now we'll see... What does that do to Saturday's attendance? Sure. You know, and that was something about last year. Like, you'd have that Kansas State game or, or TCU where, oh, you look like the team Porter thought he had, but the crowd wasn't really there. Now you've built up this huge crowd. You laid, you, you just had the dud against the Horns. What does that crowd look like when the Red Raiders come to town? Do people look at the number 20 ranking? Or do they say, eh, as Texas Tech, I, I don't think I care. Well, I'll tell you right now. If you're one of those people, you're a moron. Oklahoma 15-4 and four on the season. Uh, just real quick, big picture look at the Big 12. Uh, you saw what Texas was able to do, and they built a little momentum with the comeback win last Saturday against Baylor. Uh, the Tyrese Hunter layup at the buzzer. Uh, that's how you respond uh, to coming off of what was somewhat of an embarrassing start at the one and three. They're now tied with Oklahoma with the three and three record. As we said, Texas Tech four and one. Iowa State with a big win over Kansas State to give them their second loss of the season. What are there? Five teams at four and two. Baylor at three and two who joins Texas Tech in the off week. And then a whole host of games. So the moral of the story here is if you thought about Tuesday night and how bad that was, it's very simple. You can bounce back with a win and what would be a good quad one victory coming up on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, that's something that OU needs to keep on putting in the bank, as Porter would love to say. You know, it's, the season has worked out well for him in some regard. That Iowa State win looks better and better with every passing week. Sure. But, you know, you got to hold, hold serve at home. You didn't. We're back to even. You stole one at Cincy. You were plus one. Now you lost Texas. You're back to even. You, if you stay even throughout, you're going to be just fine. But you're still hoping that you can find one or two more road wins to kind of get you back into that plus column. It's imperative that they find a way to get a win on Saturday. Uh, before we get out of here, shout out Jenny Baranchek in the uh, Oklahoma 
women, they go down to Austin and knock off number 10, Texas, on Wednesday night, 91-87. Uh, Lexi Keys, I, we, the huge we, were, three. we were watching the game yes, up here huge three. on uh, on Wednesday night. So uh, that was a big win for them. They have uh, Kansas coming up this weekend and then a even bigger game with Kansas State, who I believe is their only loss in conference play coming up on next Tuesday. Bedlam in a week from Saturday. So, uh they might start sneaking in. They're now 6-1 and one in the Big 12 play and uh, look to be playing much better basketball than they did maybe early in conference play as well as the non-con when they uh, suffered a couple setbacks. You know, the Southern game is like, what the hell happened there? So it uh, should be interesting. I know that you'll be tuning into the uh, UMass Lowell Vermont game tonight, Absolutely. a big game in uh, the <laughs> NEC. So uh, for Bob Prisbillo, I'm Eddie Radosevich. We will see you right back here next week on the Hoops Report, hopefully talking about a couple wins. So talk to you next time.